It's an audit subcommittee. <laughs> and um, before we get started, we have this is our first meeting in person. So we actually have a person in the audience and we have a person helping us here. Um, let's introduce people because I'm not sure everyone's had a chance to meet Kathy. Kathy? I'm Kathy O'Connor, the physical education department chair. Okay. Charlotte? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Trustee Gallet Moore. Anna? Hi, I'm uh, Trustee Anna Everett. And Trustee Marcia Croninger. Kendra Murillo, interim superintendent president. Ryan Plastock, interim or uh, acting vice president of business service. And Rob Budson, IT. Okay, thanks. And we have some people as well on um, Zoom, but they get names below them, so <laughs> we, get, we, we get to see them. Um, first item, any public comment? Is anyone aware of any public comment? Okay, that takes us to item three, which is um, election of the chair for the Finance and Audit Committee for the next year. Um, and that is something that we do each year. And so um, I would say that I'm interested in continuing, but if others want to do it, let's hear from you guys. Um, I, I, I nominate Trustee Coninger to continue. Okay. Okay. I don't know if we have to do second, I'll second it. Um, shall we vote? I guess all those in favor? All those in Aye. favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. And we will move on. Um, I have a hard time logging in. So oh, we should we give you a minute here? If you don't mind, I'm just trying sure. to get in my okay, one second. So I should be able, I read everything, so if you need to go ahead on and just get started, I should be able to. Okay. I read, I read everything. Um, well, we're going to 3.2, and there's an introduction to that, which should help. Um, and uh, Kendrick, would you like, or yeah, Ryan, I would like to start. Intro? And then um, Vice President Von Stock will follow up on some of the details. Um, so we've got this item in front of the Finance and Audit Committee today because there is a financial component to the physical education building, which we all are aware of. And now that we have, I think, done some pretty good due diligence on what the actual cost of the facility will be, um, that it's time to start talking about the district portion that would be required to complete this project. And as I've said in the fall, and I continue to say, I think that um, we need to do something with the building. And I think the right option is to follow the guidance of replacing the facility. Um, I also recommend that we not consider a certificate of participation at this point, because I don't believe that with the political environment in Santa Barbara, from what I understand, it's a wise decision to go with the certificate of participation and then try to go for a general obligation bond. I think I've heard from enough people now that have spoken up that I think that's not a good way to go. I know other districts have done it. They've done it very successfully. I've actually paid off money um, in a general obligation bond, but this environment may not be one that that would work in. With that said, um, in the next few months, we are really going to have to decide, and, and it will take a few months to get to the final decisions because we don't have all the final costs. There are still some steps we've got to take. And I want to appreciate uh, Vice President Von Stock and former Vice President um, Joanne Higdon and 
former vice president of Lindsay Moss for their work on this building. I think it's taken a long time. It's just been a long project since 2016. And as noted in uh, Vice President Von Stock's memo, it has the cost of this has really gone up and has become really onerous for the college district to do. With that said, um, I do believe with the timing and what we've learned about the fact that we don't have to have um, all of the state money encumbered until June of 2025, that we have time to consider a general obligation bond for this project. With that, there's some things that we need to do. I think they've been outlined by uh, Vice President Von Stock in his memo. I have also added a couple of things to that list. And um, actually, I need to correct something. The item where I said verify with the city of Santa Barbara regarding the sea level rise, it should have said verify with Campbell Geotechnical about the sea level rise and impact of groundwater. So um, Vice President Von Stock has been working on those. So that would be one that we would really need a final um, letter and recommendation from them. And we are working on the five-year financial projection for the college um, to determine impact of debt on operations and frankly, to do a lot of things. And at this point, I would not recommend a certificate of participation. Um, the other thing is we would need to complete an environmental historical review and that hasn't started yet either. So those are, there's still, steps that have got to take place before we finalize the project. And I do not believe in giving up on this project. I think that keeping the facility in place um, would be a big mistake for this college district, so uh, as is. So I'm supportive of continuing to move the project forward. I'm going to ask um, Vice President Von Stock to go through his memos and in particular, I think the first one that's really important is the one about how the costs have increased and showing what ultimately where it's gone. And thanks to Trustee Croninger, who has noted, was able to give us the original 2016 cost of the facility and what has happened since and the pathway along. Um, Doing this, I also recognize that the longer you go on a project, the more cost escalation you will, you will have. So um, with all of that said, I can move forward. Yes. Um, just a little commentary before we get to the report. Um, and is it going to be the first document here that we're looking at, C222? Is that the one PID, PE replacement honor award? Is that the document we're going to be looking at? You're going to be calling it up. Yeah, it's the BF memo. This is the one that I would bring up. Not the owner award. Which one? Um, you're looking at the one that uh, at the bottom, BF memo. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Now, the comment that I wanted to make was that um, this Saturday, I went to the um, Santa Barbara City College, College um, Olympics and participated with the students, and we did the faculty student tug of war event. It was great fun. <laughs> I bring it up because I remember one of the first votes that I took as a new trustee was getting that getting that um, uh, that tarmac, you know, the field, done. The, field. The, field. the field. Yes, the, yeah, not tarmac. What's it called? Turf, whatever. Turf. Astro turf, whatever. Yes. Anyway, it was the first time I was actually there to see it, and it made my heart so glad because it looks beautiful. And if we had tried to do that today, you know how much it would cost. And it's so important that we make these decisions in a timely fashion. So I was really happy to be out there Saturday. I was happy that I helped make that happen. And so I just wanted to add that just as a comment on why this is important. Great. All right. Thank you. Would you like me to walk through? I, I did at the board meeting one day walk through it, but I can go through it quickly again if you like. Sure. Um, and this is the BF memo. If you could bring that one up. Sorry. Oh, here, I'll do that. Oh, you. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's got it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, really quickly, um, going back, it started as an affordable project at $30 million. Um, It's hard for me to believe that uh, you could ever replace that building even, you know, six years ago for $30 million. But it was started at $30 million. 
with a very small local match of 170,000. However, just a year or so, year and a half later, when we did a formal document with the, the state, it had come up to $35 million and nine of that in Zauer. So early on, and I think about that time, we set aside around $8 million for the project in our budget. Um, if I could have to scroll down here, let's see. Here we go. So, um, am I going to scroll if you want? So, the, if you, yeah, here's the, so this is the, the, the estimate that was in last year in August. And there's a couple of things in this that I think are important. One is the red part there. So now you can see the estimate, you know, last year was 35 million from the state, the same number. They locked that number in and doesn't matter what the project is, that's what they're gonna give us max. And, and in each one of those categories. Um, and we our, our share is up to 33 million. But the $5.9 million assumes that um, we uh, go, we release the contract. We actually engage the contractor. We've gone through an RFP, we evaluated them, and we've picked the contractor in a month. And so that's April of you know this year. Yeah, and so that 5.9 was was considered at the midpoint of construction at March, uh, April of 24. And that's it's a two-year project. So that's going to go out at least a year, right? And if we waited till the bond measure, um, March or November of 24, so it could be almost two years, you know, before we actually sign a contract. So that number will be bigger, guaranteed. Now, that's a cost escalator. Now, who knows with the economy what's going to happen? No one predicted the during the pandemic that we would have the kind of shortages we had. I was involved in some con some construction. And the oddest things didn't become available, like you know, fuse boxes or something. They're just you don't know that there's a limited number of suppliers for so many things until this, you know, the things like the pandemic happened. So the cost of certain things are very hard to predict. We do need to get another cost estimate, uh, a construction manager, an independent cost estimate. But I will tell you that they are difficult to do accurately, right? Period, by anybody. Um, so I know the cost will go up. Another thing that will affect the cost potentially is the geotechnical portion of the project, which I didn't go into in this meeting. But what the, the project calls for right now, they have done borings around the building to see what the soil is underneath it, right? It's in this area where it, it has come off, you know, historically off of the bluff. Some of it, you know, tens of thousands of years, but some of it is rock. And so they don't know to what degree under the building they've, they've estimated by these borings what that's going to be. So once they tear the right half of the building down, they'll know do borings again that are more meaningful and they'll know the actual cost. And so there's a potential right there that they have made it harder and more expensive than it needs to be. There's also the potential that they didn't put enough budget for it. So there is that potential for a change order very early on in the project. They tear the building down. In other kinds of projects, they have a thing where they call open inspect. You don't know until you open a big piece of equipment until you what it's going to be until you open it up and you look, and then you can more accurately. So this is an open and inspect type of thing for the, the soils underneath the building directly. Um, they think that they have done a good job of estimating based upon the many borings that they did for that. So um, so that's so those two elements are um, potential cost increases. Likely, um, the soils one is is not certain, but the delay in construction certainly is. So the other thing is we tried to. Um, it would have been a little bit of a um, commingling of the projects, but I tried to separate them to say there's actually two projects. So if 33.2 million is our share of the gym project, the second one is, they call it the swing space or make ready, and where we need to bring in, since we're gonna to continue to have the, the PE and athletic programs for two years, we need to figure out how they're gonna do that. And that'll cost about $4 million uh, to bring in the 
uh, temporary buildings and also to move some of the people who are in temporary buildings now out of there, like the FRC. So that's one of the things that moving the FRC out to a permanent building is something that we need to do anyway, like all of the permanent buildings, but we're working on that. And we met with the, the FRC staff and people in the library, and we sort of came up with a spot which I thought they liked, um, but we're kind of rethinking that. They've said, wait a minute, we're gonna have more information and bring a bigger group back. So we're having that meeting, I think later this week to see is, um, the space that we sort of identified before, still the one they want to go with. So we brought, we engaged an architect, and, and, and this is important too, is that we're proposing that the FRC be built in the bottom floor of the library. <clears throat> and a library has been around for a few years. So one of the things we've engaged the architect is to tell us what will it cost to bring that building potentially up to code? because there are things that have changed in the 30 years since that was built. So that's it. So that was one of the first things he was gonna do is to see to what degree is this even feasible, what we're talking, to put a separate room in there, um, maybe with a you know, separate air handling, you know, because once you enclose a room, you have to redo the lights and you have to redo the air conditioning and heating in that room so that it's controlled. So, and also does that trigger ADA issues in some other part of the building, which the SA will look at the whole building once we're in that and working on it. So, 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 so spending the money to move them is what might cause additional code upgrades and ADA is what you're saying. To to right. They need a permanent home. Mm -hmm. And and uh, if we put them in that building. And this is not in the system right now. It is not. Well, the four million dollars was to to move everybody out of the, the temporaries, but it, I don't know to what degree elaborate. I think it was more of a temporary. There was a room back there that could temporarily be. Turns out it's the librarian's office, right? <laughs> so it didn't really work. And so now, and now we're thinking about a more permanent home. So you're right, it will be an additional cost to them than the $4 million. So is, um... And this is something that has to be done according to your report that's related to the violations with the portables? No, no. That's so, something different? So, yeah. Okay. But in your report, you said that we just, we need to relocate purchasing security and the faculty resource center. Right, right. We do. And, and that's, we could relocate them anywhere, but we're trying to do it so we don't have to relocate them again. Yeah. Okay. They got okay. relocated 20 years ago and never have had a permanent home for okay. 20 years. And since so, we're building, should we build this new PE building? It makes sense to kind of do that all at the same time. Correct. Well, they're in a building that we're going to use for PE and athletics. We're going to, so we need to move them out. We need to move um, purchasing out and the police department or the, the security. security out. Uh -huh. um, we have picked a place for uh, purchasing. It's over in the Wake Center. I'm going to tour that. Not a great solution because, you know, having your receiving across town from where, where, you know, it will have to buy a couple of trucks and it'll just not be as convenient as having them here. Um, and police department, I, or the security, I keep telling the police, I don't think we've figured out exactly where they're going. They don't need a, they, they have a very large space today, which is really nice for them. Um, but generally, if I can get back to your mobile question, the mobile modular buildings that we have everywhere, um, the Coastal Commission has pretty much told us we need to get rid of right. almost yeah. every yeah. one of them. And some of them have been here for 50 years, yeah. literally 50 years. Um, so it, several of them we put on the campus temporarily when we remodeled the, the EBS building. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was here before, and it was an 18-month thing, and some of those are still here. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's, and, we, and then we put other ones in saying they're temporary, and so they don't. Well, the Coastal Commission has said uh, that they're, uh, they need to be removed. So, and we have it. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to circle back to this particular yes, exactly. set of numbers. Sorry, Jazz, I'm off. Is of basically um, swing space issues. And swing space, in other words, how do you keep your programs going when you're building a new building? Um, swing space issues are never covered by the state, they're all local costs. So that adds to our political cost, when, along with some other items that the state doesn't cover. 
Um, and the, the need to move FRC and the purchasing and the security folks is kind of a, a bump on because we're going to bump them out of where they are in the temporaries in order to use them as swing space for athletics. Is that correct? Correct. Right. We need to do that anyway. The Coastal Commission has sold it, but it's coming to you know ahead with these guys, uh, those three, because we need that space right. for to have the athletics and PE right together down there. They couldn't go out to the Wake Center or okay. basically or, or the other one. So um, anyway, if I can, um, and so I have a, a couple of estimates for there. So those are some of the other things that we were hoping to do is to move forward with the FRC feasibility. Um, move forward with LPA designing the, the make ready. And this is another this is another potential cost increase is that to do the the swing space and make ready, they need to make this area ADA accessible for the two years that it's under construction. And currently the ADA the the accessible route from the lower parking lot to the upper involves the building elevator. And we are not gonna be have that available to us. So um, they, they're gonna have to be pretty clever in figuring out how to go from that lower level to the upper level. They think they can do it. Uh, I haven't seen a drawing how it's gonna be done, um, but that, that's an also, um, it's a potential. I, as a former campus, we ended up having to buy uh, golf carts and hired students as as sort of little chauffeurs that you got your car. It was like a little Uber stand. You could walk up and say, I need a ride, and we could drive you across campus. And that's kind of a, a seven-day-a-week thing because you have activities on the campus pretty much seven days a week. Not every, but you do. So um, anyway, so there, there's it's there were a few things that might add on to the price. Um, and if you go a little bit further here, I, I we were talking about some of the funding. If we need twenty million dollars in total, which is or forty million in total, uh, these are and these were just things that Kendra and I um, can put we, as placeholders. Can we back up to eighteen? Eighteen, yes. Okay. So that's where you're starting to add everything. Up. Correct. Correct with a couple of question marks. Right, additional escalation, that's a $5.9 million number up higher that I don't know what it's gonna to grow to. And relocation to the library, I don't know what that could grow to. And you're thinking the relocation of security and purchasing is essentially free? Low cost, very yeah. low cost. Uh, to move purchasing out to the Wake Center, I've toured the building. It's They're not in a very nice space now, and they're not comparable. Not a very nice space out there, but they can make either of them work, I think. With, uh, okay. What about the, the, the parking and landscaping costs? They are um, in the other drawing. It shows the picture of the project, and the landscaping inside the dotted line is included now. And it's got just the, the driveway at the bottom. Now, it doesn't have any of the lower parking lot below that, but all of that, since it's in the dotted area, is covered. So. Covered um, by construction cost or? In the estimate, yes. Okay. Yes. Because the state doesn't pay for that. It's part of the, pro well, they're not paying for almost any of it. Yeah. Right? That's part of the, the 33 million, it's our cost. Right. Um, but I mean, specifically, you wouldn't have a line item for the state to pay for land. No, 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 no. Parking. No. Right. So that, those, are, those are part of our costs and, um, right. Then they're variable. And one of the other things that I can experience, around these is that sometimes the areas around you find things, <laughs> the edge that you end up sort of saying, well, we're here, we're doing this, we might as well. So there is always potential for that. Um, so, yes. So is anybody, we can't see the people who are on Zoom. Is anybody raising their hand there? Do we know? No one raising their hand. No, there is not. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Charlotte, Anna, any other questions? Um, so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the time 
that we're going to take to make this decision now. Because if you're talking, you know, we were originally looking at, you know, next month, obviously that's not happening. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, what we can do to make the best of this delay that we're encountering, you know, to, um, uh, to, to get to a place where we can uh, really minimize the, the length of this delay for getting these basic things done well, to move the project forward. A bond date is part of it. I mean, if we're going for a bond, we don't get to move that date. Um, and it's either March or November of 24. And, and I, for one, think November. I know Kindred, I think, thinks November. I would recommend November because it's a presidential election. We usually do better in a presidential election on a general obligation. Oh, sorry. I would recommend November because you usually do better on a presidential election for a general obligation bond. At least that's pretty much the history in California as far as general obligation bonds. Um, it would be great if we could go in March. There are people in the community advocating to go in March. And if we don't win, go in November. And I caution you, I won't be here for that, but I would caution going twice. I think you need to build the momentum. We need to finish our facilities plan. We need to get everything lined up so that when you go, it's you're strong. really ready and you're strong. Yeah, and, and, and I would just continue that. Um, I know Kindred has been working really hard to bring together the, the kinds of things that we have on this list here, which is another independent cost estimate, um, the plans that do not yet exist for swing space and DSA approval of that, the um, you know designing of the swing space, the um, question of the seismic review, unfortunately that has been drastically delayed and that is for the entire campus. So we know for the whole campus, how many buildings have serious problems that we will need to understand and address. And for me, that's a critical element of making the overall decision because I don't know how bad it is that other buildings we have not yet heard about that. So, Charlotte? Uh, well, just just point of uh, privilege, just, just, just keep it, um, Trustee got more or got or more, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I have two comments. One, I thought there was an analysis of the seismic um, status of our buildings on the campus. I thought I heard a report. Was it last year or a year before? I thought I heard a report that was done. That's my one statement. And two, um, Based on your recommendations, are you saying that we can't move forward with the development of creating um, the go ahead for this PE building until all of these other uh, things are done, like the um, um, LPA development plans for swing space, the engage a seat and firm to provide a second cost? Like we have to do these things first before we move forward. And can I just jump in real quick? Because last fall, well, I'm the one who I went in head first on this project and like literally created a spreadsheet that said, what are we missing out of this thing? Joanne Hickton came forward and brought forward some items that we were missing that we needed to do before we could really come forward. And Brian came in and he identified some other things. And now we've got that list. And okay. I think we very clearly know what we need to do before this project can move forward. And I and he's, I think Brian was so articulate on the issue that we have to be concerned about is once we open up that, tear down that building and they start the geotechnical in that half of the building, we also have potential for an additional cost, either lowering or raising uh, these costs. So yes, we are saying you have to do these things before we okay. move forward. Okay. If, if I could, to the the question, if I if I could show my other memo was I was trying to get to is that it's up there. good. Uh, so the uh, 
we've identified this as a building we shouldn't be using long term. So we need to take these steps anyway. The funding isn't going to be an issue, but if we're going to have these programs, assume we're going to have them, then we need to do something about the building. Because either, um, so that was my first point, is that we have said that it's seismically deficient. The okay. state has agreed. And we've said that it's beyond cost, uh, you know, benefits to repair it, right? It needs to, so if we did repair it, we would have to not only make it structurally sound, I mean, every system in there is broken. The heat just went out in the building. We we need every system, we need electrical, heating, plumbing, everything would be. So our $40 million would, that we're gonna contribute to a new building, we would probably be close to that to make the old building work. And, and it's got a lot of other issues in terms of um, cotton line and things. So, it seems to me like we still need to move forward as long as we're going to have these programs and use that building. We need to keep moving. And the things on the, the list are, are the things to move forward. Okay. To, to get the groundwater study, this, the uh, um, plan for the swing space, do the, the make ready, um, all of those things I think need to happen regardless, if we're gonna have the program. Okay. Uh, I would just add to that, that my concern about seeing the big picture, the situation with all of our buildings is, we could have some buildings that are worse. Um, we know Campus Center, for example, went through as a seismic project, and ultimately we decided we could not afford it. And then we um, put in, a fix for the seismic issue that was on the order of 3 million to fix it. At the same time, that was not intended as a long-term fix. And we are probably now halfway through the term that we intended. So campus winter in and of itself is, you know, looming, shall we say, as an issue, even though it has been addressed in a seismic sense, uh, temporarily at least. And I'm just concerned that we have a number of buildings in the same time frame, the same building standards, the same approach to building that may turn out to be as bad or worse. Um, and so we, I think we need to see that big picture. Um, that to me is fundamental um, because we have limited resources. Yes. So um, I'm, 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 I'm hearing the big picture idea, but I'm also, and I could be mistaken, but I'm also concerned that the longer we wait on this one, and we have done initial work and investigation and, you know, some uh, uh, early and now uh, no longer applicable uh, cost estimates, but at least we have some kind of ballpark. Um, and I think the, the thing that concerns me is that with sports and the, and the PE building as such a, you know, public facing community engagement involvement space that I would hate for us to lose time on this, uh, project that's already kind of, you know, taking forever. We got approved and one of the documents said that if we don't do it this time, the state's not we're gonna less, be less likely to get state funding again because we postponed it twice. So I'm really, you know, I hear the big picture, but I, but I want to really make sure that we don't lose this in front of us where we have the likelihood of doing something and having uh, public support for it. Yes, but um, as Kathy just said, um, I would be concerned also if some of our core academic programs were at risk, for example. Um, and at this point, I don't know. You know, I do know that, for example, our most of our labs are from the same time period, and so it it worries me that it could be a very long time before they get what they need, unless they picture again. We work it through so that we get a bond and we have money for spending that on that. So that's all part of a big. You mean the PE building and and the other? 
Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I don't envision the, a bond as being for just PE, right. if that's what we're Okay, talking okay, talking that, that was my concern. Yeah, yeah. did you have Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy. So I, I really appreciate your comments about the urgency of this. It would be a real crime if the college lost 33 million for the third time. I doubt very much, as Brian has mentioned in his memo, that they would ever get that money, any money back from the state. They just they just don't want to keep giving money to a college that will not use the money. And the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to be. And I and I understand, Marcia, how you feel about PN athletics is not being a core academic program. But as you saw at a previous board meeting, our student athletes are extremely successful. It is a student success program. They're all enrolled in 12 units on this campus or more every semester. And I think our program is a core academic program. And I think it, it's, it hurts us to actually not consider it that way, as well as what you said is it be in a front facing uh, building. It would be great for the community. I think it's time for us to start and maybe do some fundraising in the community, do some marketing. We might get some people to buy in to do naming opportunities. People want to have their names on buildings like this. I mean, I know that's not always appreciated, but in other campuses and in other colleges, uh, this happens. So it would be a real crime. And our building, I mean, I don't know about you, but every time I walk into that building, I'm worried that there's going to be an earthquake. And I know that sounds dramatic, but you don't live in that building, you know, 15 hours a day. And there, there is a risk there. And I, it worries me. It would be really tragic to have something bad happen and have you as a board say, oh, well, maybe we should have done that building. So I think, you know, as, as dramatic as that might sound to you, um, there's been a real worry for all of us that are in that building. So I really would hope that you would continue on. We did really good work with both Lindsay and Joanne. We actually have the swing space organized about what we want to do. LPA was involved and, and, and our other college architects, and we have a really good plan uh, for how that can move forward at a much less expensive number than we had originally planned. So I think we've done some good work, and it would be a shame not to continue with that work. Thank you. Trustee Gallup Moore. Um, I would like for us to just continue to move forward to, it sounds like this project has been vetted by uh, experts in the field of finance, and we are continuing to seek out other um, experts in the field of um, the swing space and second cause analysis. My recommendation is let's stop dragging this out and let's continue to move forward, get the reports that we need to get, strategize on this bond measure, how much money we're looking to ask for. Is it going to just be for to offset the cost of the PE building? Or are we going to include additional monies? for some of our other buildings that are also a seismic safety issue, um, get the story together so it's strong and concise to present in November. But I say, let's just, let's get the ball rolling. I mean, you've been talking about this since 2016. It's 2023. Yeah, I, this list is, I don't hear anyone saying don't go forward with this list, Kindred and, and then Ellen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Ellen. Sorry. So just a couple of thoughts. You know, one is some of this is going to have to happen regardless of the PE building. FRC needs to move. We need to get rid of the modular. So when the PE building is done, hopefully I'm going to come back and visit all of you and get it done in five years. Um, then those buildings have to go. So I think there's some things we have to remember in the sense of there's some things that are going to have to be done here. And one of the things that we're looking at this spring is a, a facilities assessment to really look hard at the use of all of our buildings. We've got this seismic report, and Brian just informed me that it's going to be done sooner than we thought it would, which is in a couple of weeks. So that's really good. Um, they've been able to 
find what they need. So that's coming forward. And the part that I think is really important that we start gearing up for is getting the whole board very educated on this project, moving the project continuing forward and also planning for the bond. And I think we know we've got buildings on campus that we've got to work on. We know that the physical science building is an issue. We know that the student building, the student affairs building is an issue. So we can go back down the bond list. We can pick the projects. We can get it calculated. My recommendation to the facilities committee the other night as we move forward, we bring back our survey person, True North, because we did an RFP, they came on board. And then we go ahead now and hire the consultant for the bond to advise us on what we need to do about putting our story together and get you all geared up that as we finish the strategic plan, we start the ed plan, we start the facilities plan, and hopefully those will be done by next year. You are ready to move that next January and, and really ready to go for a bond and really well organized. You know, I don't ever think, and I gotta say this, I'm not gonna argue about education, physical education right, versus right, right. science classes or whatever. Part of a college is its history and what it's known for. And, and also what it's gonna become. And it, this is gonna be more online. And what I see in Santa Barbara is the physical education portion of our college, our athletics program are important to people. And I don't wanna dismiss that in any way, shape or fashion. And I, I don't wanna dismiss that any more than if somebody is a science major or a wonderful accountant like Nicole, you know, I mean, we don't ever want to dismiss any of those. They're all important to our overall college. So I think if we try to look at it holistically and get you all the facts, and I think Brian said something that's really important that we will follow up on, is I really firmly believe that we will spend 30 to $40 million on that building if we went and tried to rehab it. You're right. Because that's, these kinds of things cost a lot of money. I mean, just hearing what the boiler would cost to put so that my office isn't freezing, $2.8 million. I mean, these are, these are costs that are real. So I think we have to really stand back, but also keep moving. And, and that's what I'm asking. I will be asking the whole board for this somewhere between now and Actually, we won't be able to do it April 6th, but somewhere right after that. But I, I really want to help get ed, keep it educated on it. Could I? She's had her hand up forever. Ellen. Ellen has had her hand up. Right. I'll be real quick. And I just want to say uh, thank you, Kindred. Uh, really, really appreciate that support and your perspective on the totality of the campus in terms of our physical infrastructure needs. They are widespread across this campus, probably with the exception of the, BC, uh, the, uh, the new West Campus Center. Probably there are things with every single building on this campus, given the age of it. Uh, and I do want to just um, point out also, again, we, we've just, you know, we've, we've commented on the, the value of physical education and athletics, but I also want to, it is a core subject. It is part of our local AA degree. And we, we serve about 20% of the students every year in our program who are seeking their AA degree. So I, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that it's not just athletics. This is for the entire campus and it's in need of that. And the, the building, even if you rehab this building, the current building is a monument to discrimination. It needs to come down. It needs to have a, a, a modern feel to it. It cannot continue to exist the way it does. This project must move forward and it must move forward in a way that is encompassing all of these um, uh, buildings across the campus. We've got big ticket items that need to be fixed on this campus. And we're in competition with every other community college for the students that are looking to further their education. Let's get it done. Right. Ken and I talked uh, a number of things today. And one of them, I said that I've talked to LPA and they're gonna have something 
next week. It's the groundwater report, not the side. So yeah. that one they still, I haven't talked to them. <laughs> or something yeah, for so, seismic. <laughs> yeah, so that one's still in the works, but I think that'll probably be a month or better because they're having to take, the, they did the surveys of every building. Um, but now they have to make the risk assessment because they need to go see what's the occupancy of each building and then put that against the structural test that they are the survey that they did. So because a building that was one or two people has a different risk than right. one, say like the like the gym that could hold thousands. So, so that's the piece we're doing now is going through our as-built drawings and trying to figure out a way to do that to take the information off of those, which are very old, and Put that into the formula that's to give us because it, it's not only the structural thing but it's the risk why would we not use our current use of the buildings for that purpose it, it's the design capacity of those rooms is what we need that's what the, the standard is um, not if i walk around and see how many people are in a room or i mean that could there. cause us to have a high risk number attached to a building that we may decide we actually don't even need um, which is kind of a different decision, but it shouldn't be for that reason. I mean, it shouldn't be a high-risk building if we're not using it. And I say that I, having done that piece before, because I've had 13 buildings come up seismically, problem, <laughs> is that when you look at the, once we do the assessment of how the buildings are being used and how much they're being used and where are the vacancies, then that now can be, we can look at the buildings. We've got the seismic assessment. Let's say this building is not being used very much and I'll just use this one because we know it's probably okay. And this one's a level seven. Then, then we probably wouldn't want to keep this building. You know, it might be the one that we let go or something. But once we do that facilities assessment, we'll have more information that I think will be useful to, but to making decisions about consolidating and all the other things, we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, a lot of work to do. And I think getting these pieces done will put the college in a really good place. And the range of scores is zero to seven? Seven, I think. And PE is a five, correct? Or parts of it are a parts five. Parts of it are a five. Parts are a five and parts are a four. And part of the physical science is a five. So you don't want to be at a five. It's just seven. You have to vacate the building. Right. Say that again. I think it's seven. You have to vacate the building. Okay. I had to. I had to red tape a building. I almost got crucified by faculty at a college I worked at. It was a beloved building. I mean, <laughs> yeah, literally red stuff all the way around which is one of the reasons why people didn't do these assessments because they didn't, didn't want to know. know yeah because well, once you know you know i do want to know <laughs> should know we all we want have to know. know i know we we need to know okay brian is there more you wanted to uh, tell no us? no thank you that's all i want to be up there let's see We are now at um, which one? Much of the sunshine. Three point three. Shall we move to three point three? Are we okay for that? No, uh, that's okay. I'll bring up the spreadsheet. I said uh, on the just to read it. That's okay if I jump in here. Total credit FTS revenue for twenty three twenty four. The next year will reflect stability protection. So again, we are being paid for roughly 2,000 students beyond our enrollment. The funding formula allows a number of protections and we're sort of enjoying, if you will, that protection again next year. That protection will go on forever, but it is next year. So with that, there are other things in our budget related to our assumptions. And that protection in 2025. I believe it does, yes. 24, 25. 24, 25. 24, 25. And it doesn't end completely right away. It, it, it's just that we won't be eligible for COLA and some other things. And so as costs go up, then our revenue from that source will not go up until we catch up again, which is this, like a $10 million. So it would, it would take us a time to get there. 
and the projection I showed earlier, I think it's, you know, we would project it like four or so million dollars, three to four million dollars per year. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, this one. So we'll hear about that later yeah. when you do the five years. Yes. Yes, and um, and I do know that I I uh, I attended the the I attended the state budget webinar, um, uh, on the governor's budget, and they were talking about um this particular issue, and one of the things that they said that I think we can take into a, uh, into consideration and work towards is, is that they're not going to completely um uh, eliminate the 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 hold harmless, but the main component is they want to see. The campus is making some progress on those enrollments. And if they see some real effort, you know, then then that's the so that it's it's um uh, you know, we have some wiggle room. You know, it's not just all gonna end because well, you no longer meet your, you know, the whole harmless is gone and you, you're not reaching your numbers. But if we're making that good faith effort, that's that's what they said, and you're showing some, you know, kind of modest or some kind of improvement in enrollment, then that's that's gonna factor in where you are. As a district, it's system wide, it's three hundred thousand students. They're paying for three hundred thousand FTS that are not enrolled, and that's one point five billion roughly. So that's the, the Department of Finance question: is is that where that one point five billion dollars goes to us to fund students who are not enrolling, or to fund all of the other things that are on the list? So. And they'll help us too. So that's why the encouragement for us to, to make that a better argument. Yeah. So can I just do a real quick plug based on that little comment? Just uh, at three o'clock next Wednesday, next Tuesday, uh, no, Wednesday, March 8th at three o'clock, you know, by the Student Affairs area, they will have the Vicarol Roundup, which is going to be another amazing event to recruit our daily enrollments mm -hmm. students. So when I just want to give a quick plug for that because I'm really, that was amazing yeah. last year to say that we are not working hard to get students. Um, I just want to let you know that would just stop by. It will be amazing. When is it? So, Kendra, when is it? Uh, Tuesday. Wednesday. 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 Uh, yes, March 8th at 3 p.m. at the McCarroll Roundup. I plan on being there. That's before your board retreat. So you can just come early and go over with me. Thank you. So are you going to? Can I just run down a few of these? Yeah. So uh, I, uh, row number 10, I just, we're, we're, our assumption is to, you know, put COLA into our budget. And we, you know, for argument's sake, are using 8% in our projections. Not sure what will be. It was 8.1, I think. Uh, or so in the governor's budget, but uh, so there we go. There we go. Uh, so we're using eight as a number. If it'll be in that ballpark, and there's been arguments that it shouldn't be any higher than eight point one nine or whatever it was, but we are using eight. The next one is item number fourteen. The district we're assuming that we stay a medium college. Um, we we're assuming that we grow slightly, but that doesn't really affect our revenues because we have to grow. Quite a bit to really affect our revenue. Where it does uh, matter, I'll show you this in a second. What, Next, I'm sorry. What did we end up with FTS? Uh, in this year? This year? I'm not sure. I think we reported 10,400 at P1. 10,400. Yeah, 10,000. Maybe 800 or 600. I can pull up. It's the P1 yeah. numbers. But we that's what we reported. And that's based on being just a little bit lower than we thought we were going to be in spring. Our moment is flat now. Everything going down. Yeah, right. Everything going down. Yeah. Yes, yes. And yes. They're working very hard to stay where we are. Uh, I, uh, line 24, uh, this is, you remember, a, a kind of a, a little bit of a controversial item in the governor's budget. They said they're going to fund next year's. Um, instructional equipment by cutting this year's. Right. So um, I don't think that will happen because a lot of deferred maintenance is already uh, uh, in the works because they already told us, you know, they gave us the money months earlier. And then so, so this is a, that one 24, we're just saying that that's a little bit of a question mark for what we might get in that. The next two items are the 
two are the more important financially to us, uh, 27 and 28. We had in our long range projection projected pretty robust growth in both of those programs. Um, because we're trying to grow those programs to, you know, to be back closer to what they were in the past, but that has not happened. It didn't happen this year. And you can see the UCs even, those are some of the biggest reductions they had. Um, out of, you know, international students are not necessarily coming here, our biggest source was Chinese, and they're not coming. Um, and so I have gone back and scaled back our projections to 10%. That's still pretty robust growth in for, but that's what we came down from, you know, 30, 40%. So I've come down in a projection going forward to only 10. And that changes things because that's, those translates to immediately to the bottom line compared to um, our other enrollment, you know, subject to the stability calculation. So those are ones that we've reduced uh, or we're proposing to reduce in our projections. Uh, the next one, um, 31, uh, if you could scroll up the uh, item 31, permanent employee salaries will be budgeted to reflect the anticipated, anticipated successful negotiation with labor groups. So that's a little bit of a diff difficult number to give you in a projection right now because we're right in the middle of right. figuring out what it is. Right. So we're just saying that in our projections, we're making some assumptions, but you know, they're based off of all of us agreeing. So right. We don't want to be presumptuous and say this is what it will be. Um, the next item, I think 34 health benefits, we think next year could go up as much as 10%. Pretty big. Uh, so usually there are two or three. This is we're thinking 10 um, is from what we've gotten from our insurance carrier. Uh, we've put in 37 and 38. We've put in the known increases to CalPERS and CalSTRS. Um, and those rates, um, CalPERS rates are set by the PERS board, and CalSTRS rates are set by the legislature. They used to be, I assume they still are. Um, and so that you can see there, um, I think I have those backwards to, yes, okay, no, it's at 19.1 to 19.6. And the next one to point out is the transfers. These are transfers. I was surprised when I got here that we have all of these transfers, but it reflects the, you know, the pandemic. We didn't use to transfer things to food service, parking, and some of these others. So um, it'd be nice for us to grow those programs back where we get rid of, this is a million dollars right there between food service and actually 1.2 um, between the, no, I'm sorry, where is it? Food service and, uh, it's the food okay. store. Is the bookstore not in there? It's the bookstore is not in there. I'm it's sure. not in it's there. there. I apologize. Be. So the bookstore needs to be as well in uh -huh. there. Yeah, that was, uh, I think it was 375 last year. Yeah, okay. So those are ones that we really want to figure out a way to uh, not have happen. The parking fund, too. Boy, that never would have been like that before. Right. <laughs> no, but you, you, you can find a parking space anywhere. Mm -hmm. here, so. Um, so obviously not a lot fewer people driving to campus. So anyway, those were my main points on the assumptions. I do have some questions, but um, Donna, do you have any? Well, just just in general, you know, with the um, uh, you know with the assumptions and the uncertainties, that's what an assumption implies that we don't know everything. But um, so how how are you feeling about? We know that there's uncertainty. We don't know, you know. Um, What's going to happen with the with the um, economic um, state uh, status for California? But uh, based on these assumptions, once we get the bookstore added in there, how are you feeling about us overall at the state? Because I know with our healthy reserves and you know the fact that we can sort of you know we're seeing her and all these others you know disappear. How are you feeling overall about where we are based on these assumptions for for um, academic year? 23, 24. Uh, good, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, like you mentioned, we have a lot of reserves, we have money in the bank to withstand a lot of income. We also, unfortunately, have a lot of vacancies. Um, between those two, um, you know, that we have a lot of vacancies. Not that we want, you know, we're not actively recruiting for these people, but we're not having a hard time 
uh, filling the vacancies. So, um, so it's a mixed message, I guess, but um, bad in that we're not achieving our goals in terms of non-resident, right? So that really limits us. Uh, we're still in negotiation, so that's uncertain. And those are big numbers right there. Um, how many people will we be able to hire? So there's a lot of uncertainty, I guess. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. But generally, if you have the kind of reserves we have, you go in with a, a lot more confidence than you would have, you know, before the pandemic or, you know, before that, when you had closer to 20% uh, you know, reserve level as opposed to what we had still the 30. So that's, and that my experience in government having 30% fund balance in your operating fund is very good. Are we at 36? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that. Trustee Gallup-Moore? And, and then I believe you're currently working on developing that more itemized budget so we can kind of really analyze if there are areas of funds not being utilized that kind of fell through the cracks. You're working on those itemized budget Correct. Um, right. documents you're working on, right? We're putting together all of next year's budget now and walk to, working through the advisory committees that are, exist on campus to explain for people what during the some of the earlier years, a lot of things were cut out of the budget, professional training and some other things. And so some people are asking, we haven't replaced vehicles. We have, you know, uh, drive through the parking lots. There's <laughs> there's a lot of things that, so people I think are starting to say, here's some of the things that I want. And these are just the obvious ones. So we'll go through a process to see what are people asking for? What can we afford before we let's be going to you? given all of the other moving parts that we have as well. So yes, we're doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, looking to see how we can afford to operate and bring a lot of the things that we've cut out back. Okay. And on our next board item, the, the our committee item, is a projection for this year. And I can sort of go into a little bit more. Okay. So just to return to uh, Anna's, and also I do have some questions, but. Returning to Anna's point about, um, and your response about the comfort level with the reserves, I just wanna remind us that the reason that we have undesignated reserves is that it's HERC money that we set aside because of the ability to calculate our loss of revenues during the pandemic. So it was federal money, it's one-time money. And the discussion has been that we would try to use that money for students, basically, for programs for students, for things we couldn't afford otherwise to do. So I hope we don't lose track of that and we think of it at least in part in those terms um, down the road. I, um, I agree with that. But the other thing is we have to spend it. Right. And we different. were going to, we asked for a plan to spend right, it. Right. And we just right. haven't okay. got there. Okay. Yeah, because that's what. <laughs> The government gave it to us, or yeah. we need to spend their money. If I could, on that point, yeah. the, the LAO report, I don't know if you read that, they also commented, um, not only are we $1.5 billion, that Paul Mike mentioned earlier, the, the, the system as a whole has gone from like 18, 20% reserves to over 30. And they, did, they noticed that too, right? Yeah. So as they're trying to figure out how to best use their money, they're saying you guys have more yeah, money than you've ever had. Yeah. Um, and and right. they all know what the source of that was. It wasn't right. because we were operating or saving our money. Otherwise, it's because we got federal money that right. grandkids will pay back. That, uh, yeah, I addressed the report that you've asked for. How to yeah. spend the money? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we don't have enough staff right now. <laughs> staff well enough to be able to figure out and sit through. You know, I got to tell you, this is the worst I've ever seen it. We cannot hire people. And so our people are working so hard, the ones that we do have, that I just want to note that. I mean, I, I hate even bugging staff. To send a note to, like, Nicole in accounting or Rudy, I just feel guilty. Like, we don't want to bug you because we know. And so... I think that's another piece of this. It's there's we're we're trying to work our way through all of this. We're starting to stabilize with some staffing, 
because we've now got sort of the BP set, we've got some Dean sets so of some of the domino effects are starting to get filled. The even just filling jobs in maintenance and operations, admin assistants, I, I've never been through anything like this. So I just have to share that with you. We, we started a list and literally we're just, the, the item number one is professional learning. Item number two would be maybe helping with the PE building because, and item number three might be fixing these roads into these, into the West Campus, some of these roadways. I mean, we've got, we've got stuff that needs to get done, but then we don't always have the staff to do it. <laughs> it's right. just, well, it's, it's not, I certainly didn't mean it as, as any kind of, um, criticism that we haven't got the plan yet. My concern is that when I came into the board, we had roughly 50 million in reserves. And rather than plan holistically for what we could do that we couldn't ordinarily do with the, what was basically extra money, um, it got frittered away on this and that and the other thing. And there was no real concrete result of having that incredible amount of money. Nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it in a specific way. Just, you know, here and there. And and I'm hoping we don't do that again. So that's that. all. We, yeah. we, we heard that. And yeah. we thank you for the 400000 you gave us for professional learning. Yeah. I think we spent every dime plus. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so something to show for it, you know, right. here's where it went. You built capacity right. in your people. Right. And I think that was really, uh, we we're grateful for it. I think a lot of people have taken advantage of it. So a couple of just more specific questions. Um, unfortunately, my copy doesn't show the numbers next to it, but um, starting at the top, when you said you're adding 8% COLA, um, Specifically last year, we broke out what we expected our enrollment to be like in dual enrollment, non-credit and all of that sort of stuff. Are we just saying same for all of those? Um, or do we think the student-centered funding formula and those other categories will be different? We haven't gotten that granular in it yes, yet. Okay. Um, but uh, like something like dual enrollment, that's where we think the, you know some of our biggest bang will be because um, there's opportunities we think there. Um, now, how much, if you put that in, how much it affects our old amount of money we got, um, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. But, but no, we'll, we'll have all- We will be doing Exactly. That. Okay. This is exactly what Kendra just said. We haven't had enough time to put the vote to this um, at all. Right. So to what we- um, Deficit factor, we always seem to budget it at zero. Do we have one for- 22-23 that's in the offing or not? No. Nothing. No. So my knowledge. The one and a half. Exactly? A deficit factor is when the, um, well, maybe I should let Brian explain it, but if you want. You know, it's one of these things where everybody has an entitlement to a certain amount of money, but that the pie is still the same size. They have to figure out how to give you what they have. And so they said, we're going to give you $100, but we only had 97 to give you, but we owe you three. Right, so it's a deficit factor is sort of where they don't have enough money to give out the money, to my understanding. Um, it's been several years since I had to deal with it, but uh, that's how my interpretation of what it is. Um, yeah, the state sets out what each of us is entitled to, but then sometimes they don't have all that money for all the colleges. And so they say, we're gonna have to take some back this right. year, which is right. always the next year in your budget. It's right. usually a deficit in property, uh, um, property. Um, taxes and yeah we haven't been doing a deficit factor but I actually think because of the conditions we're going into I, I've always traditionally kind of tried to look back and then forward in the conditions and, and move it up to like 0.5 or 1 just because of the, the circumstances and right now because we're seeing what we're seeing I actually think it would be a good idea for next year keep it in view yeah yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. it, it okay. certainly we have had them historically yes. and sometimes they're not small got it thank you um let's see the
Oh, um, transfers out. Yeah. The we're doing this emergency campus maintenance number of 650, which is the same as 2223. And I guess my question there is, and maybe it's going to be what we talk about among many things in the budget sustainability group. But when do we get back to not just emergency, but a normal, we need to maintain our buildings? I was, uh, you know, we rolled that over, not having had any more discussion about, and I honestly didn't see the word emergency in there. When I saw it, I said 650. Well, wow, that's a fraction of what that ought to be, but that's what we did yeah. this year, so I put it in. Um, you know, that used to be $2 million. It used to be it $2 million. It used um, to be that we would yeah. move our salary savings. You know, at the end of the year, you would see how did we land, and then that, a lot of that would go as in a budget adjustment at the very end of the year or the first of the next year. Um, and that's how we funded a lot of the things is we, you know, because you have vacancies. But uh, anyway, I don't know. But it, I didn't remember it saying emergency, but 650 is not enough. I mean, we, when I, early in my being on the board, we were doing 2 million a year. Right. Just flat out for this. So can I make a comment on that from an observation yes. point of view as somebody who came has come in and never had a fund 41 and 43 with $20 million in it? Uh, I think putting money in there right now, and because we're not spending it at, at any kind of rate, I have a lot of concerns with. Now you're just putting more money into a fund that continues to accumulate. And so when we start seeing some money go out of that fund, I, I, I just think you're throwing money into this thing, but I'm not, in the last two years, I haven't seen hardly any money go out of it. But it's, that's, a, that's a failing on our part, I think. Not, not a reason not to put money in there. We should have been spending it. We should have been, but the point is we haven't. And so I really think continuing to put money in and not having spent it without a clear plan that is established to spend some of it, I think to me is again, we're putting money aside and the state is saying, we didn't give you the money to put in the bank. We gave you the money to take care of your facilities and to educate students. And I just am concerned about that. I have to raise that issue as a fiduciary of the taxpayer because you know, when Brian has a chance to get a plan going and get the stuff moving along that needs to be moving along. The facilities assessment you mentioned earlier is a critical thing here because we can see, because I, I, I forgot, as I mentioned, the $2 million, is that we, we don't have a good plan right no. now to, to, to maintain the buildings. Right. And yeah. so, um, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, there was a brief time when it was attached to our budget and it said, here's what we're going to spend the two million on. That went away pretty quick. I don't know why. And also I have argued that we should be treating it like a condominium where you're required to have a reserve that you save each year for, I know I'm going to have to replace the roof in 20 years. I know I'm going to have to paint the whole building in 10, whatever. And you amortize that out and then that is how you're going to be spending your money you're planning for the big stuff and then there is the little stuff that's the term scheduled maintenance yeah you know what you need you set the money aside and you have it available when the schedule comes up for roofing right. or painting your part right. as soon as we figure out how many buildings we're going to keep <laughs> <laughs> question Absolutely. So is this something that would go in our strategic plan or is this too granular for the strategic plan? I think it's too granular in the sense of, I think it could be like an outcome that will, when you're looking at fiscal sustainability, that we do have enough money, always trying to make sure. Plan things. Right? Yeah, that, that's what we're trying to get back into. Like the presentation I'm gonna give you Thursday or Wednesday night at your retreat, is going to say we are reenacting planning at Santa Barbara City right. College, right. <laughs> you know, and that's that's what we're doing. We're trying to do that, so it's part of it in a sense. Right, right. I got you. But it's a piece yeah. way right. down here right. that we're trying I'm to fine. do. Okay. 
Okay. So I think my last one is the transfer out for IT refresh. And that question is, um, is it enough? Because um, I look back at last year and we spent, uh, we budgeted to spend 1.7 million. And we drew down the part of that was by drawing down our fund by 600,000. So, and we also had a block grant. So we spent more, considerably more than that. And I don't know if it was all IT, it was under equipment. One of the other things that, just as we were talking about planning and uh, facilities, we need to have a IT plan um, and, a, and a regular replacement plan. I think that that went away some time ago. It went away when we started crunch on the budget. Right, right. So those are things I think in IT, the same, an IT strategic long-term plan and with facilities both need to have. Yeah, as soon as your education plan is finished, that IT plan needs to fall in more quickly. Yes. But maybe we could start budget stuff so it could fit into this budget. Because yeah. we're not replacing the average age of computers at this college is, it makes me sad. It, I mean, it really makes me sad. And this is for our students. And, and, yeah, for, and for our and for our staff. Yeah, I mean, staff you've, got, you've got some amazing staff and they're working on computers that I think should probably be in the trash can. And um, I, I just, it, it, yeah, it's something that, again, there's not been these cycles going on. And I'm really pleased. I think people are, people like having Brian come on board and say, we need to have these things. And then we're funding them and we're moving them and they're continually growing. So we'll keep trying to get all that put in place. Okay. I don't even know what's the fund. What is the IT fund now? What's the balance? Do you know? I don't know. I wrote myself a note to find out how much it's. Uh, it was pretty healthy when we started the year. Okay, so we got a hand up. On, on Heard me. Uh, I just wanted to. Hi, this is Nicole Hubert. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to quickly make a statement um, to the last point about the IT refresh and how important it is. Uh, when we are thinking about being student centric and supporting the students, I want to be mindful that in order to support them, we need to support the employees. That includes having updated technology because if our technology is updated, we can extend the opportunities of how to support our students. So I just wanted to take that, take a moment to reiterate that. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We agree. We heard you. <laughs> OK. Are we ready to go to four? Yes. Open the attachment, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he was going to go. Oh, so here um, we're. This is a report I think that you've always seen. We've added a column, and uh, back in my county of Santa Barbara days, we called it the estimated actual, which is you know obviously a ridiculous phrase, but the estimated actual. Uh, is the eight plus four? It's the um, months that hit, you know, the four four forecasted months. So that's our forecast. That column, I, it doesn't have a column number, but uh, one. Can you take this up a little bit? Fourth from the right. There we go. This, so the fiscal year eight plus four forecast, and that one we've changed since you saw it at the uh, February board meeting because now we're through the end of the month. Um, so it's changed a bit, but if I can explain some of the things that we did. So we've taken down the salaries and benefits, academic classified and employee benefits, the top three lines. You can see in the adjusted budget, they're 45 million down to 44, 23 million down to 22, and employee benefits 24 down to 23. And what we did is we took the vacancies that we've had all year, and we just said, well, we took out the first eight months and that's what we save. So that's the sort of the recognized savings. We're not projecting savings going forward because we don't know how 
but it, you know, if someone was hired today, they mm -hmm. probably won't be making a paycheck for a little while because it takes a little while to come on board. So that's the, the reduction in the cost. Now in the contingency line, 5.3 million, we're anticipating that we spend all of that. And that's sort of part of our, what you all set aside uh, for a number of things, but one of them was our benefit increases. So we're anticipating that all of that is spent. Um, and so that's, we're saying that's gonna go away. Now you remember, we've offered more than the COLA. Mm -hmm. So it'll be more than that. So that's slightly, that's gonna be slightly more expensive if we do settle um, than that. On the other side, below that, we have lowered the local revenue line by a million. We don't know exactly what it's gonna be, but we're thinking non-resident. And so we've lowered the expenses and we've also lowered the, uh, the non-resident. And I think in our other projections that it's gonna be lower even than a million dollars. So there are, that's, there are some moving parts here, but we're saying um, if we had full employment starting tomorrow we, and, uh, and we settled with what was in the contingency, we would spend 114 million. And right now for what we know, it's at least $115 million in revenue, but that's soft as well. So those are, that's our projection right now and not having done the kind of analysis we really need to do again, because we're pretty shorthanded, but we're getting better because we're, we're taking just several things into account. Now, if I can scroll real quickly here, there's a page back here. So here's all the assumptions and they're pretty much unchanged, but we did say here, international and out of state, we said we've reduced those in the forecast. Mm -hmm. They're not reduced in the budget, they're reduced in the forecast on here. And this is a budget assumption, so it's kind of a confusing thing, but I wanted to show we have reduced it in the forecast, not in the budget. The budget still called for it to be, as you can see, pretty robust growth. So, um, so we, but we've reduced it in our forecast. Now, here's the page that I want to sort of highlight. So here we have the adopted budget, and then we've had budget adjustments during the year. Um, and so then we, we kind of show what those are. So 1.5 million. So here are all the things that make up that 1.5 million, the things that we've changed during the year. $300,000 to, to increase salaries, mostly like in stipends and overtime and things like that that weren't budgeted. Um, there are a number of things we did bring on a new uh, consultant Cambridge West and we took it out of contingency. There a, so there's a wash there between those two. They were um, in and out. Um, but some of the other things that we've done during the year equaling the one, the, you know, the 1.5 million. Then there were some just other minor changes. So in total, we've changed 1.4 million. We were going to have a slight surplus by the budget. Now, this is just by the budget, not by our estimates. By the budget, we would be just about breaking even. Slight deficit. This is upside down, and we will fix that. Kid and I are both saying, I'm not sure if it's always been that way. We're used to having yeah, revenues yeah. on top and expenditures, and so the plus and minuses are a little confusing, but, um, but the numbers are right. I mean, it's, it takes, it's like a little puzzle to, to, to do it. But uh, anyway, I think it really shows sort of where we started, what we've changed, you know, where the budget shows we would land. And now our forecasts are, we've taken 2.5 million out of the salaries. Now remember that's eight and there's still four left. So you could conceivably have another half of that again, another 1.2 million and additional. So say we don't hire any, all those vacancies stay vacant. Well, we'll save another million dollars. Um, and at the same time, our revenues are down a million, but we don't know what those numbers are. And it could be down a little bit more as that as well. And so here's what our forecast shows. Rather than just about breaking even, we would add 1.3 million to fund balance. So that's that's sort of what you know, in summary, what we're thinking. And so then you put the one point. So our budget down here, adopted budget, showed us growing fund balance by 1.3, and then we were the adjusted budget shows us using some, and we're back to sort of almost exactly where we started with the adopted budget in our projection. And our projection is still pretty. Talk, I guess, but but it's getting better. So, do we know how our recruitment is going for those um, faculty and staff that we're trying to hire? Do we have any idea of how it's going? Are we going to have this next million over because nobody's coming and accepting our jobs? 
So for faculty, we would definitely carry over the money in the faculty area because those positions were budgeted this year and we will not be hiring them until like April and May and they will start next July and August. Okay. So they come on board next year. We saw, we know the 24 people in the faculty ranks would not be until next year. As far as some of the positions um, that we're trying to fill, we've had, we haven't ha always had really good luck in the uh, classified area in trying to fill positions. That's been tough. I think we've been able to fill some of the management positions lately, but we've had a couple fall out because of our salaries. Great. So um, that's the other thing we're up against is sort of um, in Santa Barbara. When you look at our total comp, we, we that's part of the reason for our offer out there right now is we need to bring it up a little bit because we need to be competitive. Right. This expensive time. Yeah. So that's one of the things. So I, I really do believe we will end probably with a, somewhere so upwards of probably two million in salary savings. Um, but I will say that HR is working as really as hard as they can. I don't know how much more they can do, right? But and the managers, everybody's trying to work. You know, the managers offered a couple of weeks ago, how do we help? You know, and so they're trying to volunteer for EEO jobs and so on this hiring committee. So I think everybody's trying really hard. I don't know. I was just, hoping, just curious about our status of everything. This is, this is not a windfall that we want. We oh. want to be. We want to hire people. Well, that's exactly. What we don't want this. There right. used to be a time when we slowed down hiring, right? Yeah. And now we're just trying to hire. Yeah. One of the things too in a budget assumptions I forgot to highlight is we do budget for hiring these people. So we, we budget by position. And so if we have a position, we include the budget. And I, uh, yeah, I understand uh, that, but the, the bodies aren't there, so we got to money. Right, so we may have, if you have 5% vacancy, that's about $5 million, 4 point something, almost $5 million. So, um, you know, that's sort of what we have right now is about that. Um, and we're not budgeting to save that. We're budgeting to all those will be filled um, because you know, we don't want to, if we are successful, we want to have the money already in the budget for those positions. So. But the, the 24 faculty we're trying to hire isn't in this budget because we knew we wouldn't hire them, right? right? No, they were in this budget. They were budgeted in the budget. Well, it's not all 24, but the, so, there's, there's like 12 faculty members budgeted in the okay. budget. And are they in, are they eight? Out of 12 in, or are they all here because you know you won't hire them until next year in your four in your eight, uh, eight plus four? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how we handle it. We were just okay. we were trying to do something quickly to get what is our salary savings to date. Mm -hmm. If they weren't here, let's take them out. And that's what we did. And so now they may, they're not going to be any of them are 10 month employees. So you're right, they wouldn't get we wouldn't necessarily have them in the budget for two of those months. Yeah. So again, it's a very quick, just trying to come up with another. But we finally have position control. Well, we have position control, but I think it has a lot of work still. And I mean, we finally, I feel like we have it in place and they're trying to keep it updated, but we've got work to do. I'm not going to say that it's perfect by any means. So, um, I, I keep wanting the budget assumptions, the 22-23 list of budget assumptions, and you've got reduced in forecast for our international um, and out of state. And I know you're all busy and can't always get to this, but I keep hoping that this chart will help tell us what about of our some what of our assumptions were right and what of our assumptions were wrong. And so ultimately, I like the reduced in forecast by X dollars would be really helpful because I don't know if it's the out of state students or the international students or what. I, I, what my experience is, it's not in the budget assumptions, it's an analysis of the variance. I budgeted 45 million in salaries, I spent 42, here's the reason why, these were the variances. 
So that's sort of a, in a quarterly report, you explain the variance. Your budget assumptions are still what you set the budget at. You made those those because that's your plan. And your variances are your deviations from plan. And the, it may be because utilities doubled, the gas went up, or I couldn't hire those people, or whatever. And so having a detailed explanation of the variance is the next step we're trying to get. No, I appreciate that explanation, but it, it certain budget assumptions have, in my experience, been repeatedly wrong. I see. And then I think we learned something, you know, hey, we're just being too optimistic year after year after year on this, or right. pessimistic. So yeah. I, that's why I think it's really great that Brian's going to variance is because when he, we get that next piece in place, and he'll be able to say, we, we assumed this, and this is this to the panel. You know, right. it's like the international. It didn't grow like we set up for the budget. This is now the variance. Right. So no, I I'm not against the variance. I like the variance. I'm just saying this to me is a quick chart or, oh, we assumed this, and it didn't happen. Got it. Got it. And then when I see it year after year, <laughs> that's what we got. <laughs> Mostly as it relates to revenue. If, yeah. I'm, if I'm anticipating right. some revenue, I wanted to see. But, but there is an revenue. item here that probably is reduced in the forecast also, which is your expenditures for salary and benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be reduced in the forecast. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we could have put that. Uh, there was a line that says, I don't remember which one. Uh, we, we budget for all of the positions. And we can say we have reduced that in our, just like we did it. Yeah. You're right, we should have done And then my last thought is on our very last page at the bottom there, I would hope we would go over to the not excluding the transfer out and contingencies, and like we talked about earlier. Down the Wait, road. Say that again? Um, we talked about the 20% is calculated on expenditures, which do include other outgo transfer out and appropriation for contingencies because we do expect to spend those. Right, right. So, so oh, that's what we were going to fix. Yes, yeah, that's, that's not been, I didn't do the math. That, yeah. That's probably not been done on this. Yeah. Did you yeah. do the math? It's still no, smoke. actually, I didn't do the math. I looked yeah. at the footnote and said, well, you have got Oh, I see. Yet. Oh, you're right. You're right. I haven't uh, yes. uh, so multiple anyway. things. So you're right. When we down the road, it would be yes. great to right. catch that. Yeah, I thought we agreed we'd do we it did. last time. So. <laughs> we did. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other comments, questions? I like Charlotte's sweatshirt, the, the 1909. Yeah. Thank you. This is really nice. Oh. <laughs> I found him. <laughs> yes. Okay. Ooh. Well, in that case, we're adjourned and thank you. Is there anything else? We're good. Oh, um, We're good. items for future consideration. I forgot that. That's on the agenda. Oh. I'm sorry. I forgot to put my updates on the agenda. Well, we've been so, I mean, that's right. So oh, do you want to put it under yourself. items for future consideration? Yes. yes. <laughs> you could update. <laughs> that's fine. <We're... laughs> for um, um, items for future consideration, I think we should um, keep like a similar running list like we do with, at our board trustee meetings of some of the things that we're working on to um, solidify and make a stronger presentation of our budget. Like some of the things that um, our VP of business um, is working on to, to remind us, like your footnote to make sure we come back to that. And so as we prepare for our next uh, finance audit committee, we can look at that running list and see what are the items that we got completed so we can discuss that further. Because we may find ways we can um, identify more money that's not being utilized because it's going to Above the item line that is not being utilized, and why is that? That's what I think. Then we won't forget stuff because it sounds like we're planning to do a lot of really good, meaningful cleanup, but we should maybe start creating a running list. Yeah, I think they are doing a lot of. So I just there's a lot going on. So mm -hmm. We have a lot of work. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and I, I we'll appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. But for me, I'm a list kind of person. I like to create a list. And then as I get things completed, I like to go to that list and cross it out so that you're not beating yourself up about all the work you're doing because you can actually see the work that you're getting completed. I agree. That's me. That's how I like to kind of a pen and paper highlight a person if you haven't noticed that. 
<laughs> so, yeah, good meeting. Anna, anything? Yes, um, I I would like to uh, to see our facilities planning budget and IT strategic planning budgets really jump started and, and you know kick back at your operation. You mean you'd like to have one? <laughs> <laughs> or two. Yeah. Or two. Yes. But we're going to go. I, I'm actually going to contact Roy and get the assessment RFP written and, and facilities plan um, RFP written. Um, those will be coming up real quick, I think. Okay. Just trying. I was so, going to try to take the lead on it. Take it so Brian can focus with some other stuff and you're just running by him. Because yeah, it's going to help us with our with our bond narrative and all that stuff. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. Well, Cambridge maybe can help. Yeah, Cambridge. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward the to the budget work. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm really looking forward to that too. And they actually do facilities plans. I didn't even thought about that. They did. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. I mean, there's. A, Something called the facilities condition index. Yeah. Oh, that that one is. We haven't had that. We have to do that. We have to do the assessment of how we're using the facilities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's everything that feeds into fusion. And, yeah. I think we had sixteen thousand students at one time here. We have all of these portables. Now we have twenty thousand students, and right. of them are remote. A lot of our faculty and staff are working on them. Right. It seems like we should be able to have maintain, eat, cool, a lot fewer square feet. Right. 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 And since those things got to go anyway, just got to ready for that <laughs> new reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right size our facilities. Yeah. Our clerk. Yes. All right. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, folks in the in in, in the virtual land. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Right. Well, thank you for being.